How's everyone doing? Good. Uh, so I know I'm not dressed in the official uh, ConnectJS attire. Uh, I also am apparently having a very bad hair day, so I apologize for that. Um, my name is Raju, uh, and we're going to talk about resting in AngularJS. Uh, let me give you a brief overview of what this talk is about. This talk essentially is showing you all the machinery that Angular leverages uh, when you do $HTTP or dollar resource calls. Um, there are several pieces that you need to be aware of when you are using this. Uh, each one of them gives you a certain amount of power to control the request that actually is made on the wire. So when you really think about it, um, dollar HTTP is just wrapping the XHR object, right? The XML HTTP request object under the covers. Uh, the machinery sits between you using HTTP and the actual wire, the actual metal that makes the request. So with that said, uh, I'm also, by the way, loosely typed on Twitter. You don't need to know that. This is all. Love. But the, the discussion starts with a digression. And the digression here is because of a choice that the Angular team has made. Uh, so although this may not look like something you need to talk about when you talk about HTTP, it has now become something that we need to be cognizant of. So before I start, how many of you have used a promises library in this room? Okay, for those who have not used a promises library, whether you agree with the premise of promises or not isn't the point. The point is that you have to start to learn what a promise library does and how to use it. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. Wow, did I start early? Well, these guys are just walking in late. All the troublemakers in the room. So a quick overview of what promises are, and the big question is why do we need a promises library to begin with? So for those who are already familiar with promises, this is a brief overview. For those who are new, uh, a, a reason why you should start looking into promises. How many of you have used callbacks to make asynchronous requests over the wire? Uh, so if you've done any kind of AJAX, right, whether it's jQuery or Angular or Ember, whatever, you have done callbacks. Uh, the truth of the matter is, when it comes to JavaScript, callbacks are a nature of the language. If you don't use callbacks, you're going against the grain of the language. JavaScript will forever remain a single-threaded execution context. And in order to work around that, you have to use something like callbacks. Right? That's the nature of the language. Here's the problem. If you've ever done something like this, make an AJAX call, get a user information from the server, extract some sort of ID from that information, make a second call to get the user profile. Once you get the profile, you check and see if they're registered as, you know, for your email subscriptions. And if they are not registered, then you attempt to register them via third AJAX call. Right, so here you're fetching user details. When you get it, you get back the user profile, and when that comes back, you see if the user subscribed for email. Yes, the typical use case, you have a nested set of AJAX calls you need to make. The problem here is that the minute you start the first AJAX call, you are already in an async mode. You are in a different execution context than your main thread. The minute you have that, the problem is that your callback has to be used right here and then. You cannot put the callback anywhere else because here's your main thread, here's your async context over here. The, that call can only happen when your main thread has some free CPU cycles, right? So the problem with asynchronous, forgive me, with callbacks is everything is now, 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 now. Everything has to go in the callback. There is no way to say, package the data that came back from the async call and hand it to somebody else for a future use. 
you either use it there and then or it is gone does that make sense to everyone now that you are in there you better know what to do with it and hopefully you don't enter this notion of asynchronous calls within asynchronous calls how many of you have ever tried to trap an error over here anyone tried error handling in callbacks how many of you have tried it how many of you succeeded if an error happens in there console.log to cross your fingers that the server never goes down right you don't have a choice there you cannot do exception handling cleanly i'm not saying it cannot be done but you cannot do it cleanly inside an asynchronous call it is not humanly possible the point i'm trying to make here is that it's very hard for you to reason about what will happen when will it happen and what happens when something goes wrong because you are not thinking in a linear way you are thinking in an asynchronous way so this nesting that you see there's a there's a name for it it's called callback hell you can you can go to it callbackhell.com there's a whole website dedicated to this construct right and for what it's worth that website is worth reading because they do give you ways to work with asynchronous operations they give you ways to work with callbacks now the truth of the matter here is that that's the only way to do it whether you like it or not that's the only way to work with asynchronous calls in javascript to the rescue summary of slides blah 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 the big one is this for me monolithic handler functions your asynchronous callback becomes bigger and bigger over time because you can't move that code outside of the async block you don't have the context so somebody invented promises now promises are a library that attack on to the language at least in ecmascript 5 uh, anyone look at ecmascript 6 anyone attend the es6 talk that was there this morning i don't know if he mentioned promises i did he mention promises yeah they're coming as part of the language so you now have promises as first class in the language i'm not sure that's a great idea truth be told this is something that should be part of a library not part of the core language. however they're putting in the language so be it it is it's coming in the language or i'll be here in the language uh, but promises right now act as a library the third party tack on on top of what you are using the big popular implementation over here is q uh, if you just google for promise the letter q you will find this implementation it is the canonical reference for how promises are implemented in javascript um, he also inspired the a plus spec which essentially forms the basis for ecmascript 6 here's how you use a promises library you have fetch user details then do something then do something else if an error happens catch it and then finally do some clean up does that read a little easier than callbacks a little bit right because you are linearizing the operations as a human being you can reason about this process think about what happened what sequence does it happen when does it happen and what happens when something goes wrong now under the covers you have to understand one thing promises are a library they cannot they cannot change the execution context one time context the language javascript still remains single threaded all they're doing under the covers over here is abstracting away writing the callbacks from you so you are write callbacks you write this code it writes the callbacks manages the state and the error propagation for you that's essentially what it's doing right so it's an abstraction on top of what is definitively the language behavior one thing to bear in mind is the then api so the way you think about this is do promise me right promise me that at some point in the future you will go and fetch the user details that's how you read this 
So the library makes a promise to you that at some point in the future, I will make this call for you. And when that call comes back, then please do some other operation. Now the way this works is if the fetch user details was a successful operation, your server returned a 200 or 200 to a 300 XXX whatever code, then it will invoke your fetch user profile function. However, if the server returns a 404 or a 500, the library will then execute your fail to find user function. So the way this works is a promise is propagated success or failure down the then chain. So each one of this is a promise. You can chain promises just like you can see over here. The point being, linearize the operation and give us appropriate ways to hook into success or failure. That's it. There's nothing more to it than that. With that said, how many of you new to promises? Like this is your first discussion of promises in this in this room right now. Anyone? Okay. This is probably a confusing discussion for you. And my stand on promises is they are confusing. They add they make writing the code easier. They make it harder for you to wrap your head around them. Now with that said, Here's what a promise looks like. You can think of it as a FedEx box, a box that contains two things, an operation that's going to be performed and its state. Did I finish or did I fail? So here we can say, hey, Ajax, hey, promise library, please go fetch my user details for me. And it gives you back this box. It's not a, it's a box with an API and the box inside it contains this state. Have I made this request yet? You can ask the promise. Have you made this request yet? And if not, that's okay. I'll just wait for some more time. The box exposes this API called a then. So what you're saying is when you give me this box back, I'm going to attach two callbacks to it. Now, initially a promise is in a state of pending. Pending means I've not finished this operation. I've not even attempted the operation. At some point in time, the promise is resolved. When the library turns around, oh, sorry, JavaScript turns around and has the time to make the call, it will then cause the promise to shift to a different state called the resolution state, at which point either the promise is fulfilled or rejected. Fulfilled implies it was successful. Rejected implies that the operation failed for some reason, whatever the reason is. If the promise was fulfilled, it was successful, then your success handler is invoked. If it failed, then your failure handler is invoked. Does that kind of make sense to everyone? It's just a box with an API. The thing to bear in mind over here is this then method returns a box that looks exactly like this. So each then invocation returns a box. So you can, you can forward the operation to other interesting parties. Now that was a very, very fast overview of promises. But essentially, if you're new to promises, what you want to take away from this discussion is that they are not a new execution context, right? They are not making JavaScript multi-threaded all of a sudden. They're just abstracting away callbacks from you. Um, what is referred to as a pyramid of doom, which is the indentation you see when you have callbacks, they essentially just flatten that. The biggest thing, the most important thing here is that they are context free. And what that means is I can take that box and pass it to a function. I can take that box and return it from a function and that data that's associated with the potential result of that operation ships with the box. So you don't have these monolithic callback functions. You just have a one liner and it gives you this box back and you can give it, go give it to somebody else. So one analogy I like try to use is what's your name, sir? Ryan. And what's your name, sir? Bob. So one analogy, analogy I like to give is I owe 
Ryan money and Ryan owes Bob money, right? So the future operation over here is I'll get paid in two weeks. At some point in time in the future, I will get paid. If I get paid, I will send some money his way, right? I promised him I'll pay him, so I'll send the money to him when I get paid, and then he can forward that to Bob. However, let's say I get fired, which is very likely for what it's worth, right? If I get fired, I just shrug and say, I'm going to invoke Ryan's success, oh, sorry, error handler, in which case he says, oops, return, forward that error to Bob. So all three of us get notified if I fail or succeed. That's the analogy I like to give. Um, it's more funny when I can show it to you in code, but anyways. Uh, I have a slide here for creating promises. Does anyone know if you're going to get these slide decks? All right, but if you want it, come over and I'll give you a copy. All right, why this digression? This digression is because promises are now baked everywhere in Angular, everywhere. And that's what I meant by this digression is forced upon us by the Angular team. Up until now, we had a choice when you made an Ajax call via HTTP to use callbacks or to use the promise library. Forward from 1.4x, there are deprecation signs that are showing up in the Angular docs that are specifically telling you not to use the callbacks. They have chosen to use promises going forward, which means you have to use promises going forward. Now, philosophically, you may disagree with this. Philosophically, I'm on the fence. I don't necessarily think abstracting away callbacks is the best idea in the world. Yes, it makes our life easier. But I would like to have the choice of whether I use a callback or I use a promise library. But with Angular, it's over. Game over. So, HTTP, resource, timeout, even configuration options for HTTP all use promises now. Get used to it. Like it, love it, whatever you have to do. Figure it out, right? Yes, sir. My understanding is yes. And ES6 is not helping. I mean, they're building promises into the language, right? So it's almost going against the grain of the language now to not use promises, uh, which is great and dandy for asynchronous operations. But callbacks, like I said, are working with the nature of the language. That's how JavaScript was designed, was to work with callbacks. Um, so that's why I said, philosophically, you may disagree with this. Um, where I stand, I'm on the fence. I do have friends who are big node guys, and they will never touch a promises library if, it could, if their life depended on it. They are the white-bearded callback guys that will never shift. They're just waiting for ES7, I think, because ES7 has got uh, async built into the language, and so that is an alternative to promises. However, if Angular chooses to go the route they're going, even that won't help you. This promises is the way. All right, so after that digression, let's talk about $HTTP. How many of you have done HTTP calls in Angular? Awesome. All right. You might have seen this API. You've done http.get, some URL, and then if you have success, invoke the success handler. Otherwise, invoke the error handler. You can notice right off the bat, this then keyword is a straight giveaway into promises. $http.whatever put post, head, delete, get, all return promises. They used to have a, what was it, a success and a failure callback API, which is deprecated. This is the only way to do it. So notice that each one of them can be chained with a then. These are all promises all the way down. But what I do want to point out here is that you may have done something like this. However, there's another way to do that, is you can post, um, forgive me, if you put 
a URL like this. So here I'm putting some data, this movie object, on this endpoint. Yes, everyone clear on that? Which is completely equivalent to doing put URL with an object, with a very specific API called data colon something. So exactly the same thing. Under the covers, when you do this call, it's creating an object that looks something like this with a key data colon payload, right? Which is equivalent to doing this. You call it HTTP directly as a constructor or a factory function, and you give it an object with the method on it, the URL on it, and the data on it and you're making the same exact equivalent call. So just to, just to dive a little bit deeper into what's going on under the covers, what happens is that this URL actually gets, create, gets created into an object with one key in it called URL, and then you give it another object, and Angular merges this object with this object to get this object. Does that make sense to everyone? Which means at the end of the day, under the covers, you are always working with this little guy, whether you like it or not. And that guy is called the config object. The config object is where the power is in, a, in HTTP calls. They let you tweak every single request on a per request basis, right? This is a per request call. This request specifically has a URL, a method, and a data payload. The point of this discussion being, start to love and learn the config object. How many of you have looked at the API for config under HTTP? Good. Definitely the guy who does all the heavy lifting for you, also the guy who will let you tweak your requests. This is the most specific way to cater, to tailor your HTTP request. The config object has a bunch of attributes that you can use. So we've already seen URL, method, data. You can even set a headers object for that request and say for specifically for this request, I am going to accept only application JSON. Whereas generically, you might be accepting application slash XML, right? For this method, for this call alone, please use this. Now, the one interesting thing that came out in 1.3x is the timeout property. The timeout property existed for a while. How many of you use timeouts in, in HTTP? Good. It was a number. You could say after 30 seconds, please time out this request. Now, when you really think about it, who's timing out the request? It's XHR object. It's the XML HTTP request that knows to time out the request. It's not this guy. Boss, right? He just sits there and tells you what to do. You're the one who's running around like a headless chicken, right? But in 1.3x, they said not only can you give timeout a number, but a good friend, a promise. How many of you have tried to cancel an HTTP request based on user input? So like let's say user drags a to up, give them a little X button, and the X button. Have you ever tried canceling that request? You can't. Because he is not the guy doing the work. It's the XHR object who's doing the work. So they introduced this new thing called a promise. You can set a promise on the timeout. And if the promise is successful, here's the catch. You need to pay attention here. If the promise is successful before the request comes back, then the request is canceled. Does that make sense to everyone? The promise has to be successful. Basically what you are saying is if this promise is a success, cancel this request, which is almost backwards when you think about it. But that's the way they designed it. 
So let me show you some code. Um, I prefer to do it this way. What I have here is my controller. Uh, this is called main controller. I'm injecting HTTP and the $Q library in there. The $Q library is Angular's promise implementation. So they have their own library for promises, which is inspired by the Q library I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a, some sort of a salute to the, the canonical reference for promises. So I inject HTTP and Q in there. And here's where I make the request. I have a button that has a URL. I log starting the request. I make an HTTP get. Notice I supply the URL with a config object. And the config object only has one property on it called defer.promise. This is a promise. I create the promise up here and I have a cancel button that if the user clicks cancel it will demonstrate how to cancel a request. Does that make sense to everyone? Uh, he, oops, sorry about that. Here's my highly polished application. Yes? No, it resolves the promise. So the, uh -huh. Oh, it will invoke the failure. Yes. So his question, the gentleman's question up front was, I have a HTTP GET which returns me a promise. I can attach a success and a handler respond uh, function to that in this case I'm only attaching a success handler um, what will get called and the answer is the error handler will get called um, so just to demonstrate a slow uh, and I'll explain what this is in a second but I have a delay interceptor in my code so what that does is it makes the request five seconds long I'm not quick enough on the buttons to hit submit and cancel quickly enough all right, so let us first see what happens when I start the slow request. Um, so when I click the button, we wait five seconds, and you should see some data show up over here. So Mississippi 1, Mississippi 2, Mississippi 3, Mississippi 4, Mississippi 5. That did not work. Uh, what happened? Okay, so I've got a back end running. Let's try this again. Yeah, something is not right. I should see initiating request. I should see this log statement, right? This is what happens when you challenge the god, demo gods in front of a big crowd. Ah, uh, come on. Uh, okay, let's try some. Yeah, I don't definitely don't want warnings. Give me one more minute. If I don't figure it out, I'll just show you the code. Uh, so it's definitely connected. I'm definitely getting a five second. You can see the five second delay before the page shows up because everything is delayed by five seconds in this application. Um, yeah, definitely having problems. Which is too bad. That was a pretty impressive demo.
Oh, well. All right. I'll just show you the code. So for, forgive me again for this. Um, I tried it while I was sitting there in the previous talk, and it worked. Um, the way this works is that you have the config object attached to a promise. If the promise succeeds, if it's resolved, then this HTTP request will be canceled. That's how you do cancels in Angular. So if you ever have to do an HTTP cancel, this is your approach. Now, I was giving this talk a couple of weeks ago, and somebody asked me, what if I want to do a timed uh, timeout? So I want to say 30 seconds or the user hits cancel. Right? How do you do that? Well, you can't do it here. What you have to do is you do something like dollar timeout, give it a function that says cancel, resolve that promise in 30 seconds. So that automatically calls the promise to be resolved, which cancels the request under the covers. Does that make sense to everyone? And I apologize again for the demo. Um, I'm sorry, what was that? It already has a time, but this timeout is waiting on something to call it to happen. So the point is, if you give the user an X and you want the timeout to happen automatically after 30 seconds, whichever happens first, right? You want a time timeout and you want the user to be able to cancel then that's how you do it. So you, if you want both the options. If you know the time and that's your only constraint, don't even bother with all this. Just put 30 seconds over here. OK. All right. So the point of this discussion is that um, config is your friend. Config can also, also has a cache property. Has anyone used caching in Angular? OK. You can cache the results of certain requests. So if you do HTTP get user profile and you know it's never going to change, you can tell the config object, cache the results of this request. So another useful property of the config. I'm not going to dive into all the details here, but I would suggest you look at the API and experiment, because it has far more power than you think. Now, the thing to bear in mind here is this is on a request basis, right? This is not globally across your application. This is on a per request basis that you have to assemble this object. Now, what if globally you knew you were always going to accept application slash JSON? Or if you knew globally that on a post, can you only accept JSON for other requests, you can only accept XML? How do you set that? This will get annoying if you have to do it on every request, right? So what you have for that are something called default headers. Default headers work like this. Now, before I go there, how many of you know what the run method does in Angular? What does it do? Correct. How many Java programmers in the room? Any Java programmers? Oh, wow. I usually get a bigger show of hands than that. All right. Let me give you the 411 on how all of this works. You have an application. How, how many of you use the dot config method to do your route providers? OK, so you have a dot config method on your module. You have a run method on your module. And then you have all the other stuff you're used to, controllers, directives, services, factories. The config portion of your application, the way you view it, is like the bootstrap process of the runtime. So if you're used to any other programming language, like Java or C-sharp or whatever, you have a way to say, here's the amount of memory the JVM is allowed to use. Yes, or here's the amount of, here's the garbage collector you use for this, this particular runtime. All that stuff has to be read before the runtime even wakes up. Right? Otherwise, how do you set those settings? The config portion of Angular is the static portion. There are no runtime constructs available to you in the config portion of your application. So in the config portion of your application, you can't use factories. 
you can't use services. None of that is available because none of it ha can be instantiated. Your runtime hasn't come up yet. The run method is like the main method, the main entry into your program. This is the actual wake up of your application life cycle. And then everything else happens. Does that make sense to everyone? You need to know these three phases, config, run, everything else. The run method, at this point, you do have things like factories and services available to you. You can inject $HTTP over here. You cannot inject $HTTP in your config method. You will get an error. The fact that you can inject $HTTP in here means that if you're going to do something dynamic, like for example, check if the user is authenticated, you can do that over here. The run method is typically the place where you will see this line of code, $HTTP dot defaults dot headers dot blah blah blah. This is where you set globally for all requests certain headers. Like in this case, I'm setting the authorization header. However, to get the authorization token, you might need to make an HTTP request. Yes? So, you can make the HTTP request in here and then set this globally for every request. That's how you do global settings of headers, is using the HTTP default headers. Now, of course, you can do this anywhere. You can do it in a controller, you can do it inside a directive, but if I were to come to your application tomorrow and start looking around, the last place I would look for this would be a controller. Right? Doesn't make any sense. It's like setting a global property hidden in a method inside some class. This is the place where I would expect to see stuff like this. Here, now let me take a step back. If you set a header over here, like authorization equals something, but when you make the request, you set the authorization to blank using the config object, that guy will win over this guy because he is more specific to the request than this is. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions? You guys are really quiet. That lunch must have been really good. Was it good? Okay. I didn't have lunch, so. So if you see my code over here, if I could, oops, you won't do that. I'm setting headers right here. And so for every request that goes out of this application, I will have set this basic authorization header, um, which I can overwrite if I need to, but I can forget about it. Once I set it, I can forget about it. Everything just works. Of course, on top of this, I could have done http.get slash user slash auth token. Because I have HTTP. I can make that request. Now what happened? Hmm. Okay. Finally, you have config, which is the phase before the run portion. You have no runtime constructs available to you at this point. None. You don't have HTTP. You don't have queue. You don't have any of that. If you have instantiated factories, right, if you have a factory declaration, not available to you. At this point, you can set defaults for every request. However, you don't set it on HTTP, you set it on HTTP provider. Does anyone know what the HTTP provider is? He's the guy who makes the HTTP guy. He's the HTTP provider, literally. He manufactures HTTP for you. He is available here. He is not available in run, or post run. HTTP is not available here, but HTTP is available run and post run. Do you see the distinction? 
Here, what I'm saying is, hey, HTTP provider, before you even construct, before you even create Mr. HTTP, know this information. And it will automatically configure dollar HTTP to have headers for this, headers, so on and so forth. I can also tell the provider that only for post methods accept application slash JSON. So if you want to set headers specifically for a specific type of request, right, get, put, post, delete, just lowercase the method name, put it here, and you can set whatever headers you want for that request. Does that make sense? So you have three tiers now. Per request, which will always win, HTTP defaults, which is the second guy who will win, and then the least most important, but the most static, right? This is stuff you know up front before your application wakes up. I'm going to accept application JSON. Just put it up here. This is where you would put stuff like that. No dynamic stuff is allowed here, right? I can't put authentication tokens here. Why? Don't have it. Can't use it. Can't get the token. You can't talk on the wire. How's everyone doing? Questions? Yeah, like just like uh, this guy. You can set it at one at one time. Yes, absolutely. But there are some things you know upfront, right? You know application JSON. Your request has. There are some like uh, caching policies that you might want to, you know, either set up some cookies or whatever. Put it up here because this is where I would look. But as a developer, I would look for that information here. Yes, sir. Correct. So priority-wise, that's increasing order. If you, in your specific request, you set this header for post to be application slash XML, he wins over this guy. Cool. Finally, interceptors. What are interceptors? This is effectively the decorator pattern, if you've done decorator patterns before, right? Um, the guy who's doing all the legwork is Mr. XML HTTP request, right? What we can do with interceptors is we can layer specific functionality before the request goes on the wire. And when the response comes back and goes to the then invocation, you can intercept the response on the way out. So this lets you get between $HTTP dot get something and the dot then. That's where it lets you do stuff. So for now, just look at this in an abstract manner. I'll show you the code in a second. Basically, you have these objects that you set up. They have very specific methods. Uh, you can have the method request or request and request error, or it can have a method response and response error, so on and so forth. The first guy cannot, does not make sense to have a request error because if he fails, the next guy's error will be called. So let me show you what this means. When the request is made, when the HTTP.get something is made, the config object is manufactured under the covers. Whether you like it or not, the config object is manufactured. That config object is supplied to the first request method of the first interceptor. He can do whatever he wants with it. He can change it, he can create a new config object, or he can throw an error. Let's say he tweaks the config object a little bit. He adds one more header, or he checks for something like, is the user still logged in? Or is the user timed out, right? Uh, he might say, oh, this is good to go. He, if he returns the config object, it will be handed to the next interceptor, so on and so forth down the chain. If anyone throws an error, then the subsequent request errors will be invoked. All of this is happening before your request actually goes on the wire, before you actually make contact with metal. 
right? If you're successful all the way, the request is actually made via XML HTTP request object. When the response comes back, then the in next interceptor's response method is called or response error. Let's say you got a 404, you got a 500. Then the response error method will be called, so on and so forth, done. All of this is well before your dot then method is called. Does that make sense to everyone? So the way you write an interceptor, is it's typically a factory or a service? It can be any one of them. Typically, I like factories. If you like services, use services. It doesn't matter. Uh, in this case, notice that this is returning an object which has two methods, oh, sorry, three methods, request, response, and response error, which means that this object can act both as a request interceptor and a response interceptor. So when the request is made, this method will be called, and then when the response comes back over the wire, this method will be called, or if it was a failure, this method will be called. So basically, this object can sit on this side and on this side. That's essentially what this object means. Oops. The way you set up the intercept, that's just constructing it. How do you layer it before the XML HTTP request object? Is you use the config method and say .http provider .interceptors .push. Now, I just said this a few minutes ago, factories are not available to you in the config method, right? However, this is a factory. But if you notice, string, notice string, you will make this mistake when you go home. You will say only config interceptor like you normally do and bad things will happen. Yes, this is a string, a string. Let me repeat this, a string. Yes, you cannot say config interceptor. You cannot inject config interceptor because it is not available to you. You only give it the name of the interceptor. And when the application actually wakes up, Angular will stack all the interceptors in order. So, let me show you my interceptor. So I have this delay interceptor over here. Can everyone read that font, by the way? Is that big enough for you in the back? Okay. Uh, he takes a timeout in a queue library, and he only has one method on him called request, which means he's primarily a request interceptor. And what I'm saying is you are going to get the config object supplied to you. You are going to wait for five seconds before you simply return the config object back. Don't worry about the deferred dot promise. That's just me using promises. But however, I can wait for five seconds here before the request goes on further down the stack. I also have a config interceptor that doesn't do much. He just adds an authorization header and returns it. Now, the way I configure it is notice in the config method, I layer them like this. First comes the delay interceptor, then comes the config interceptor. That ordering you need to be cognizant of. If you flip the order on these two, you're saying something very different. Because remember those layers I showed you? That ordering means something, typically. So you want, and it doesn't matter in my case, but let me, my app doesn't work. Um, actually, I can prove this works. So let me comment this out. Oops. If I refresh the page, notice it shows up immediately. However, if I uncomment this, remember, this is a global request. 
It's globally affecting every HTTP request across the board. And you cannot change that. The interceptor behavior is concretized once you layer them on. So now when I refresh the page, oh, come on. Mississippi 1, Mississippi 2, Mississippi 3, Mississippi 4, Mississippi 5. Come on, don't let me down. There you go. Five seconds. Because that, those, that controller gets initialized when the application wakes up. So you have five second delay. Does that make sense to everyone? So the gist over here is you are far, far away from Mr. XML XHR object. And all this machinery is in play between you and him. And you can leverage it. Set custom headers on a per request basis. Set custom headers globally. Set static headers globally. And change the behavior of every request that goes through your application. So I had a question yesterday in my Angular workshop. The gentleman asked me, the response that comes back over the wire is a di in a different format than we would like to consume it in our Angular application. So the JSON structure is different. How do I make it happen that every time a response comes back, I can massage the response before I hand it off? What would you do now? Create a response interceptor, it, trap the response, check if whatever format you're looking for is there. If it's not, massage the data, go, and now it's done globally. One place to fix the problem. Yes? And then finally, you have Mr. Resource. Anyone use Resource before? I'm not the biggest fan of Mr. Resource, I will admit. But he's handy. Uh, what Resource allows you to do is he's yet another level of abstraction on top of HTTP, which means that everything you've learned here today, config, the run changes, the, conf uh, the interceptors, everything works for dollar resource because he's just using dollar HTTP under the covers. All that machinery is still in place. The nice thing about dollar resource is that you can define a resource like so. Notice that I don't have, for my movie, I don't have HTTP.get, HTTP.put, HTTP.post. I only have one method, dollar resource, with a specific setup of a URL. And the point behind a resource is that if your backend follows certain conventions, you get all those restful methods for free. So let me explain what this means. If you define a resource like this, your movie object, your movie factory, automatically gets a method called query. And query will make a get request on slash movies for you. And it knows that because you've told it this. It automatically gets a query method, a get method, and a save method, which is pretty cool, right? I mean, a lot of what we do is crud over, well, when I use the word rest, I always cringe because I have a friend of mine who is a big rest uh, fan, and he completely despises the way we use rest. But that's a different story. The point is, we do crud over rest. Typically, you want to get all, get an item, put an item, post an item, delete an item. That's what you want to do. The resource just makes it easier. So you have movie.save, which is slash movies and does a post on it. And all of these methods are functions of the fact that you're always going off this URL. Right? So put, post, get. You also get, I don't know why I have to do here, by the way, that's a typo. That should be movie. But I apologize for that. But new movie dot dollar save is again just provided to you. If you create a new movie object and you invoke dollar save on it, it will do a post on slash to do's for you. You don't have to write the code for it. Um, you have delete and remove, which are just aliases of each other, just a way to invoke HTTP delete on that URL. And the reason it knows the ID is because this is an object, right, which has an ID on it. Does that make sense to everyone? Uh, sometimes a little too much magic for me, 
truth be told, but useful in some situations. No, no, no. This is the object that is being deleted. So let's say you fetched a to-do to from the database. You got an instance back, and you on that instance you invoke dollar $remove, it already has the ID inside it. So it knows. That's why it's lowercase t, not uppercase t. See, over here it's uppercase m, uppercase m, uppercase m. But here it's lowercase t because it's the actual instance, not the factory. Little subtle, but... And here's a way to add more methods. So I can actually say, here's an endpoint. Uh, it will take this ID attribute out of the object to use as the ID. And please give me one more method called update that does a put. And so I can add more methods to an already existing list of methods that I get for free. So you get fetch, query, sorry, query, get, delete, save. Uh, and now you get update because of my configuration. How's everyone doing so far? Good? Awesome. I'm sorry, what? No. But it's JavaScript. You can always disable something. Yes, sir. Yes. Because they all, so the question in the back is, do the interceptors affect resource? The answer is yes, because it uses HTTP under the covers. And so now I can call dollar update. So a couple of resources for you. This is a really interesting talk from ng-conf, uh, going postal with promises. So if you're not familiar with the promises library, it is a really good talk. He's, he's far more funnier than I am. Um, and a couple of resource links to the Angular UI, uh, theme credits, and that's all I have for you today. So if you have questions, fire away. Otherwise, feel free to go grab a cup of coffee early. Thanks for coming in. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're all returns promises. All right, we'll come on front and we'll talk.